morning. Welcome to worship. My name is Pastor Randy Landeman, and I pastor the First United Methodist Church of West Newton, and I also pastor the Hermony United Methodist Church. It's good to have you in worship with us today. Let's bow our heads just for a moment. Dear Jesus, we love you. We thank you for your goodness to us. And I ask that as we are here today, that you would be glorified. Thank you for your love. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. It's good to have you with us here today. Thank you. The scripture reading for today comes from Judges 6, verses 11 through 16. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the oak at Ophrah, which belonged to Johash, the Ev Abezarite, as his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty warrior. Gideon answered him, But sir, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our ancestors recounted to us, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But the, now the Lord has cast us off and given us into the hand of Midian. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. I hereby commission you. He responded, But sir, how can I deliver Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. The Lord said to him, But I will be with you, and you shall strike down the Midianites, every one of them. We're going to sing, Here I Am, Lord. Uh, what we'd like to do is we're going to sing, Joey's going to sing the uh, verses. And I'd like you guys to join us in the chorus, uh, because this really is a, uh, this is a song of the
Almighty God, may your word go forth with power today. We love you. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. You know, years ago, and anybody who's known me for more than a couple hours, I have struggled with my weight since I have been in college. And I have read everything, it seems like I can read, somehow hoping there's some kind of secret that if I read this, that all of a sudden that changes everything. And it's probably just because I don't have enough willpower at this point to do it. But I remember reading this book years ago. It was by a guy named Charlie Shepp. And he's written a couple, uh, he's written a number of books. He's a very good writer. But this particular book, um, and I've read some other books by him, and this book was called Devotions for Dyers. Thinking that perhaps Charlie Shepp would have something to say that I've never read before. And in the first chapter, talked about how imagine in your mind what you looked like when God first thought of you. And I know theologically God doesn't first think of anything because he's always known everything. But the way he was talking in this chapter was when God created you, when God had a plan for you, what did you look like? You know, because God obviously has, and now he was talking about dying then. And I'm not really concerned about that today, but the idea is when God first thought of us, when God first created us, the plan that God has for us, is that plan the way He, the way he understood us? Is that anything like how we view ourselves? You know, do I see myself the way God sees me? Or do I have this distorted image of who I am? Who did God create? to be. You know, most of us, we have a distorted view of who we are and of what we can become. Whether it's because of sin, that we live in a sinful world, or because of the sin we've committed ourselves. Whether it's because of bad habits that we've developed over our life. Whether it's because of the failures that we've committed in our life. Whether it's because of other people who have hurt us. You know, life has a way of beating you down. And often what happens is we see ourselves in light of all of that. And when we do that, of course, we have a distorted view. It says, as judge, it says in Judges 6, 13, Gideon answered him, But sir, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our ancestors recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has cast us off and given us into the hand of Midian. You know, in our life, there's going to be bad events. Just as bad events happened to Israel, this was after Moses. This was after the ten plagues. This was after they had walked through the Red Sea with water on each side on dry ground. This is after the whole book of Joshua. Whenever you hear people talk about a victory in biblical proportions, normally they're referring to the book of Joshua, where a handful of untrained Israelites destroy a whole boatload of the enemy. Whenever there's that kind of a victory, it's a biblical, you know, it's a victory in biblical proportions. That's the book of Joshua. And here Joshua's died, and now these people, and, and Gideon is asking, what about all of those things? Why are we experiencing what we are today? And whenever you and I experience bad events, especially when we think about the good old days, about the way things used to be, we tend to think that and we have a distorted view of who we are. It also says in Judges, he responded, but sir, how can I deliver Israel? My clan is the weakest in the nation. And I am the least in my family. He's thinking to himself there. I'm a nobody. You ever thought that about yourself? You ever kind of thought that you're a nobody? That everybody else has things going for them, but I'm a nobody? I mean, Gideon in a sense, it's sort of like you have a litter of cats, and there's about ten of them. 
And there's always the runt. The one that didn't get enough food or didn't get enough blood while it was still in the womb. It just didn't get enough and somehow it never matures. Sometimes I think we are like that. Gideon said, I'm the least in my family. My brothers and sisters, they all have more than I do. And we're the, weak, and we're the weakest in our families, the weakest in the clan. He's telling the angel here, I have nothing going for me. This is who I am. He had a distorted view. You ever felt that way? You have nothing going for you. You just don't have what it takes. And when that happens, your view of yourself is distorted. You think to yourself, God could never use me. And so we have Gideon's view of himself. And that's contrasted in this passage with who God says that Gideon is. In Judges 6.12, and I love how this is. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty warrior. And I don't think that that was said sarcastically. I mean, sometimes we'll say something like that to somebody, or somebody will say something like that to us. Yeah, Randy, you're the best there is. And they kind of have that grin. And they mean anything but the fact that you're the best there is. Gideon had this low view of but here he's being told by God, you mighty warrior. Gideon was a wimp. He was a nobody from a family of nobodies. He had never fought a battle. And yet God says, Gideon, you are a mighty, mighty warrior. You know, what does God call you and I? You think God looks at us? Says Gary, Mr. Wimp, does God say that to us? Glory, does God say to you, Glory, you're just a nobody. You're not going to amount to anything. We think that about ourselves. But God looks at you and says, Gary, Gary, you are a mighty warrior. And Glory looks at you and says, Glory, you're a mighty warrior. All of those things that we want to be, in a sense. God has already called us those things. I guarantee you, God doesn't give us the same names that we have for ourselves. You know, when King David was called to be the king, he was the youngest of all of his brothers. Samuel was told to go and anoint as the next king of Israel one of the sons of Jesse. And so naturally, Jesse calls all the sons. He starts with the oldest, and he goes down through there. And finally, all of them are denied. And Samuel, just, at this point, says, do you have any other, any other sons? And Jesse says, oh yeah, I've got little David. He's out in the field working, but surely he's not the one you want. He's the youngest. He's, he's not able to do a whole lot. Or Samuel says, go call. It says in 1 Samuel 16, verses 6 and 7, when they came, he looked in that Samuel. Samuel, so it's a phrase this way, when he came, Samuel the prophet looked at Elah and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. You know, just like then, we tend to see ourselves from a human perspective. We have a distorted view of ourselves. But God sees us as who we can become with his help. We look at our intelligence, we look at our experience. We look at our education. We look at all of those kind of things. God sees the heart. And God sees what we will become with His help. God knows that we cannot do it by ourselves. And so God gives us help. And then, God calls 
calls us to do the impossible. Now, can you imagine, and in about a month or so, our nominations committee, we call it the Way Leadership Committee, we're going to get together and we're going to start talking about positions in the church for next year. And can you imagine if you got a phone call and the person on the other side, whether it's myself or somebody else from that committee, they say, look, we've thought about it and we've prayed about it and we have the perfect position for you. There's a group of <clears throat> high energetic kids. Another way of saying rowdy. We have a group of <clears throat> high energetic children that you would be perfect to teach. Now, if you've ever taught a class, trust me, you'd rather face hungry lions than perhaps go into a classroom of children who are there. You walk in the first day, and they will push you to the limit of what perhaps you know how to do. It's an impossible task. God calls us to do impossible tasks for Him. Whether it's teaching a class, or working with the youth, or in the case of Gideon, God said, I want you to get rid of the Midianites. And you think to yourself, I could never do that. And so God says to Gideon, then the Lord turned to him and said, go in this might of yours, and deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. I hereby commission you. I can almost see Gideon there thinking to himself like that. How in the world am I supposed to do this? How in the world can I do this impossible task? Myself, nobody else. God's commissioned me because I'm a mighty warrior. He's called me that. I don't see that in myself. He wants me to go and do this for Him. Let me tell you, God will call us to do impossible things. That which is set before the church to do is an impossibility. That which God will call you to do is impossible if you view it from your perspective. If you use the distorted view of yourself, that is when we think it's impossible. But if we see it in light of the God who created the universe, the God who can do all things, the God who brought the Israelites out of Egypt and through the Red Sea. The ones who led them through the book of Joshua. That's the same God that called Gideon. And that's the same God, my friends. When God wants you to do something for Him, it looks impossible to us. But God says that nothing is impossible with God. God can do anything. He wants to do the impossible through you. And let me tell you, we're going to get in, in, into this in our third sermon about Gideon more so. God will call us to do the impossible because God will never share His glory. If we're able to get it done, then God doesn't get that much glory when we get it done because people will say, oh, we have a lot of talent. God doesn't necessarily call the sharpest uh, knife in the shelf, as we say. God calls people like me who stuttered as a teenager. God calls people who can't do what He's called them to do. So when they see it get done, everybody in the room says, that was because of the power of God. When God calls the person who has nothing to raw talent, it's easy to think that maybe that person through their ingenuity or creativity was able to get it done. Almost everybody who does great things for God will tell you that they were never able to do those things. In themselves. God will ask you to do the impossible, but God will never ask you to do the impossible by yourself. He will be with you. And so the question is, how do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as a loser? As one who has failed? As one who just messes up? As one who's not loved? Blame you. Or do you see yourself as a warrior, as someone who is loved, especially by God, as someone who's a disciple of Christ, or someone who's capable? You know, you and I will hear voices all the time, and I tell you right now, most of you in this room, right now, you're
you're going to hear voices. And I don't mean voices like you actually hear them with your ears, but I mean the kind of voices we hear in our head. Satan will want you to listen to the voices that say, you'll never do it. Every time you've tried, you've messed up. You're going to mess up again. Don't raise your hand to volunteer. Don't try to do anything for the Lord. They're better off without you. That church would be stronger if you weren't even in it. Those are the kind of voices that Satan wants you to hear. But at the same time, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you saying, you can do it. I will help you. You're not going to be doing this by yourself. I'll give you every ability that you need. Every resource that you need, I will provide. Just trust me and have faith. And so there's voices that are bad. There's voices that are good. The question is what voices, in a sense, do we choose to listen to? Thankfully, as we do over the next, as we look at it over the next few sermons, Gideon listened. And that's why with 300 men, he defeated all the Midianites and drove them out. You know, Philippians 4.13, I know you know this verse quite well, I'm sure. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You notice it doesn't say, I can do most things. I can do some things. I can do a boatload of things. It doesn't say that. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Anything that God calls you to do, you can do it through the power of His Spirit. His power of His Almighty God, we love you. And Father, even as I have preached this message, there have been voices in the back of my mind that reminded me of the times that I have failed. Voices that have reminded me that perhaps I'm not the person to do whatever you called me to do. That all I can do is mess it up. And Father, I'm sure that each of us in this sanctuary right now, for those who are listening online, I'm sure that there's those voices that are telling us we will never do it. But Father, your Spirit is talking to us, telling us, we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. Help us to listen to you.